Okay. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, let me start. First of all, I apologize for not being uh, able to be there. I'm traveling and uh, it's a bit hard to schedule, certainly. And thank you for accommodating this, uh, let's say, online presentation. And hopefully it'll work out well. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction of uh, my research group and some of the research topics that we're doing as part of EFCL. This is a very dense and high bandwidth presentation. Uh, these slides will be available. I'm going to skip a lot of slides, but hopefully this will give you an overview of what we're doing in Safari. Uh, I'll skip my own introduction. Probably many people know about me. Uh, basically, uh, we're interested in building fundamentally better architectures. We're focusing on computer architecture, hardware, software, co-design, computing systems, biomatics, bioinformatics, and security, and many, many aspects of computing system design in general, any important problem. These are four key current directions that we're following. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but uh, we're looking into how to fundamentally design secure, reliable, safe, trustworthy architectures, basically. And at the same time, how to make computing much more energy efficient, memory centric. I'm going to spend some time on that one. At the same time, looking at fundamental low latency and predictability techniques, and also at the same time, specializing the architectures as much as possible so that we can deal with the huge uh, problem with, uh, that we're having with applications like machine learning, genomics, medicine, and health, and who knows what else will be do coming down in the, uh, in, the, in the future. And we take a, a, a broad approach to a computer architecture, looking at algorithms to devices and co-designing across the hierarchy so that we can achieve uh, the highest energy efficiency and performance, as well as security, dependability, et cetera, other characteristics. And I believe this is really important going into the future, uh, both as technology scaling as well as application scaling make our lives harder and harder going into the future. Okay, this is a very busy slide. This actually summarizes a lot of the research topics that are going on in the group. Uh, I'm going to touch upon some of these, but we do broad research spanning applications, systems, and logic with architecture at the center. And this is my research group. Very quickly, uh, we have more than 40 researchers in the group, and uh, there are two representatives right now, uh, Hayu and Geraldo, who are there. And we release some newsletters if you're interested. You can take a look at information online. Uh, we do a lot of teaching and research clearly, and I believe these are actually very much coupled with each other. So uh, we do a lot of community education as well, and we put our lectures online. Uh, in fact, uh, we're live streaming uh, lectures currently, advanced computer architecture lectures. So if people are interested in attending and contributing, uh, everybody's very welcome uh, to these live streams. That's true for other lectures that we have, like the seminar lectures, uh, and we did live stream the undergraduate lectures last semester. And we also have some live seminars if people are interested in attending uh, some live seminars. There's uh, an upcoming one on data-centric and data-aware frameworks, which I will briefly talk about. And if you, have a, if you want a longer version of this talk, it's also online. Uh, we believe a lot in open sourcing, so we open source as much as possible our artifacts, and you can find them online. And you can find essentially everything that I will talk about, the papers, uh, videos, and artifacts openly on, on these websites. And I will acknowledge the funding that we receive from uh, many folks, including EFCL. Uh, and then I will just jump into some of the research topics that we're exploring. I'll just give you a quick, broad overview. As I said, we want to build fundamentally better architectures. And these are the four key issues we're tackling. And uh, the, the unifying perspective currently is we want to really design fundamentally better architectures. And these architectures are going to make decisions for us in the field and uh, they will be essentially pervasive everywhere. So they have to be intelligent because we're going to make use of intelligence. But the way we design architecture should also be intelligent. We're overwhelmed by data today. So architectures going forward should also be data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware, in our opinion. And the EFCL projects that are happening right now are actually centered across these three dimensions, if you will. So the problem we're, uh, we're trying to tackle is computing is really bottlenecked by data today. All important workloads are data-intensive. They require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data and increasingly sophisticated things are being done on data today. And on top of this data is increasing, we can generate more data than we can process. And you can see this in many, many application domains that I'm not gonna talk about. You can see this in the mobile domain as well. And you can see this, especially in some emerging technologies like genome analysis. Today, we can sequence many, many more genomes than we can really analyze really carefully. And this, is, this has become a lot more important today, especially with COVID-19, of course, but our sequencing machines are quite good, but our analysis engines in both hardware and software are not measuring up. As a result, scientific discovery and health and medical advancements are getting delayed, in my opinion. 
And uh, these are some example sequencing technologies that we're working on. If you're interested, you can read the papers. But essentially, we're trying to accelerate these sequencing, uh, sequence analysis techniques so that we can make decisions at real time, let's say within a minute. If you can give those devices to doctors or even patients, people, uh, privately, they can do some of their analysis and they can basically get some guidance, let's say. And we have a bunch of papers related to this that I'm not going to talk about. We look a lot into FPGA-based near-memory acceleration of these as well. But this is, I believe, is important going into the future. And you can see some of the devices that already exist, except these devices are not capable of processing data inside the device. So they have to move data all around the system. Okay, I'm going to skip some of these slides. But basically, this is an example. Data overwhelms modern machines we designed today. It overwhelms the storage, communication, and computation capabilities, and greatly impacts robustness, energy performance, and cost. And the way we have designed computing systems is not going to work uh, going into the future. Basically, computation is free today. Computation is, in fact, this is a quote that I uh, borrow from an Intel fellow as well. Uh, uh, we have been advocating that computation has been free for some time. And I recently heard uh, Ian Young, who is an Intel fellow, who, who also repeated the exact same word saying computation is free. And uh, even though computation is free, uh, our designs are not very good at taking advantage of that computation. Basically, most of the system designs we have today are dedicated to storing and moving data. And if you look at a single node, more than 90% of the system is really dedicated to data storage and movement units like main memory and caches, et cetera. Yet our systems are still bottlenecked by memory. Most of the time, the processors are waiting for memory. So there seems to be something wrong with this picture and we're trying to correct that, let's say. And if you look at uh, what's wrong, if you delve into the details, we do a lot of studies on real systems and we find out that most of the energy and time is spent on data movement. You can see one study with Google over here. And this is because a memory access is not just costly in terms of performance, but it's also extremely costly in terms of energy. You can see that a memory access consumes two to three orders of magnitude the energy of a complex edition. And I think we need to change this. We need to design intelligent architectures that handle data well. So the question is, of course, how do we handle data well? I think we need to ensure data does not overwhelm the components via intelligent algorithms, intelligent architectures, and more importantly, intelligent algorithm architecture device co-designs. At the same time, we want to take advantage of vast amounts of data and metadata flowing in the system so that we can self-learn in our architecture. We can always improve the decision. So if you want an intelligent machine that makes intelligent decisions, it itself should improve itself with the data that's flowing through the system. And on top of this, we would like to understand and exploit properties of different data that's flowing through the system so that we can, again, self-optimize and improve. So I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but basically uh, we are very processor-centric today as opposed to data-centric. Uh, we are very human-driven in our designs today in both hardware and software algorithms, especially hardware algorithms. We should be more data-driven. The computer should learn over time. And uh, we're very component-aware uh, uh, component decision-driven in our system today, as opposed to data-aware, meaning that we don't understand the data flowing through the system and customize the data in a general way. In some specialized domains, we try to do that, but in general purpose systems, we're quite bad at that, let's say. Okay, I'm not going to focus on these a lot, but let me give you a perspective uh, in the data-centric uh, domain, let's say. And even, even if you look at a data-centric architecture, there are many properties you would like to satisfy. First of all, if data is very important and data moves to the bottleneck, we should really not move data. We should process data where it resides. We should have low latency and low energy access to data. We should have low cost data storage and processing. And also we should intelligently manage data. And these are at least four properties. We're working on all of them, but let me focus on one of them, which is processing data where it makes sense. As I mentioned, our current design principles cause great energy waste because we're very processor centric. Everything has to go through the processor so that it can be processed. And we should really change that. We need a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement, compute where it makes sense, where data resides, and make computing architectures more data-centric. And we're striving towards this in essentially uh, across the stack, how to enable this. And this will hopefully enable fundamentally energy efficient architectures and also fundamentally higher performance architectures because if data doesn't move a lot, latency is reduced, uh, performance increases, and also energy uh, efficiency increases. So our goal is to enable processing in memory in the general sense in many different structures. And there are clearly many, many questions over here across the stack that I'm not going to even talk about over here, but we're trying to tackle a lot of these questions. And in the end, in my opinion, we really need to tackle everything across the stack as well as the theoretical foundations of computing. Today's theoretical foundations of computing is really based on counting operations. If you uh, take a theory of computing class, for example, it's very processor centric. The mindset is very processor centric. We need a data-centric paradigm and rethink the foundations of computing in a data-centric manner. So with that, I think uh, that's the mindset essentially. And we would like to treat uh, memory as an accelerator 
But that accelerator has low latency, high bandwidth, low energy access to vast amounts of data, as opposed to all of the other accelerators we have on the processor side. And if you're interested, we write papers about it. I'm going to mention a couple of these very quickly uh, soon. Uh, but this is a recent overview paper that we wrote on the topic. And there are some others. Let me quickly talk about two approaches to processing near memory and processing using memory. These are two ways of memory-centric computing. Processing using memory is fundamentally different from today's systems because you basically repurpose uh, the storage and memory structures so that they can, uh, you can, you can not use them, you, you don't use them only for storage, but also you can use their analog operational properties for computation. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but this requires a lot of programming changes, et cetera, that we're tackling right now. On the other hand, processing near memory is you have the processor and the memory, they're far away from each other. Processor comes closer and closer and closer and closer. At some point it gets immersed with memory. So from a programming perspective, near memory is actually easier to do in my opinion. But with processing using memory, meaning repurposing the analog computation capability of memory structures, we can actually get significant improvements. For example, in DRAM activating multiple rows performs and, or not, and majority and not operations, they get 30 to 60x performance energy improvements and new memory technologies enable even more opportunities because they're fundamentally non vault And these are some papers that I'm not going to talk about uh, that we have written on the topic. More recently, we've, we've been tackling some programmability issues so that we can actually efficiently compute complex operations, for example, like convolutions. We can provide the ability to implement arbitrary operations to the programmer, as well as uh, with minimal changes to the DRM architecture. And again, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the paper. Geraldo can actually mention this a lot because it's his first author work. But basically, key results show that you can get significant performance energy efficiency compared to existing CPUs and GPUs. And this is, uh, we, I believe we're, we're working on this to ease the adoption of these architectures going into the future. The second approach, processing near memory is already happening. Basically, there are already existing chips. This is OpMem chips that basically put processors inside the memory chips uh, near the memory banks. These are real modules. We're experimenting with these real modules. And you can actually see a bunch of talks and papers relate to this. Uh, and we actually released benchmark suites where people can actually evaluate these engines and uh, contribute to them. We're happy to work with anyone. And we have a bunch of key takeaways. And these uh, architectures are quite good, actually, in some workloads compared to existing CPUs and GPUs. But there are some, uh, some, work, some other workloads that they're not very good at. And we're trying to actually make it much more general purpose going into the future. And you can read the papers and watch some of Juan's uh, presentations. Some of these are Safari live seminars. Uh, as I mentioned, we're also looking at FPGA-based near memory acceleration. This already exists as well. And we also um, analyze uh, workloads, many, many workloads, so that we can understand what should be offloaded uh, to the main memory. Uh, and there are many profiling approaches. These tools are all open source, so we can actually take them and start using them. Uh, this is a study where, uh, led by Geraldo again, uh, where we analyzed more than 300 applications and 77,000 functions from many domains and looked at their suitability for near data processing. And we basically developed a memory bottleneck analysis technique that's uh, essentially very methodical uh, that can enable you to decide what kind of uh, data movement mitigation techniques to use, including near data processing. And again, this is open source. We're very much open to feedback on this one. And uh, with that, I think I will very quickly mention there are many, many adoption. If you want to change the paradigm in hardware and software, there are many, many adoption issues and we're tackling them. I believe most importantly, we really need to change the mindset of how we treat computing today. As opposed to processor centric, we should really make it data centric. And I think we need to revisit the entire stack at the end, but I believe we, uh, get, we can get there step by step. I will not be able to talk about data driven self optimizing architectures and data aware architectures, but these are two very synergistic directions with the data centric architecture paradigm, but certainly we release a lot of tutorials, et cetera, uh, on our website. So I will conclude basically with leaving the slide. I think we need much more intelligent architectures for intelligent machines into the future. And I think some of the principles actually exist in nature and kind of in, in our systems, we've been violating many of these principles so that we can get efficiency in some certain way, but maybe we should merge the principles that we have found in processor centric computation with some of the principles that are found in nature going into the future. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions.